Settle in class, back to basics with a witchy encounter you can slot into campaigns or run as a quick one shot. And not just for Halloween. This works well for any time of year and I'll give you a little tips on how to tweak it for your season. I'll be balancing this for a level 5 party in both D&D 5e and Pathfinder 2e. About time I made another encounter, I want to bring these back as a running series again. I'll be covering both the intended path and two alternate versions for if they go careening off the rails. You ready? Let's go! We begin our tale with a thriving rural village, a bustling inn and tavern, basic shops, and loose hub that starts to take shape. The town is growing, they've started laying cobble. You can even see marking where wooden walls will eventually protect the place. Nobody's really working on it right now, though. They're busy with harvest season. And of course, the pride of this place is the Shining Chapel. We'll make it a temple of Serenray, goddess of farmers and compassion. Calls for redemption of everyone, even monsters if they're willing to try, though she does demand swift death to those who won't. The center of town will have people getting ready for a harvest festival, preparing pavilions, hauling out tables, practicing the fiddle. If your party doesn't do the usual thing of going to a tavern and speaking to the bartender, have someone stop them to let them know that the priest is looking for a little help. Something's been poking around the farms at night, and they need someone to hunt the beast down. It's not unusual for this time of year, but with everyone focused on the harvest and the festival, they just haven't had time to track it down. If the party doesn't seem interested or presses for more info, they will reveal a little more, but ask it be kept secret. They don't really know why, but they get this feeling that's not just a terror bird or hungry bear this time. Not that they'd ever accuse the priest of lying, of course, he's kind of bad at it to be honest, but they get the feeling that he's trying not to alarm the town during such a critical time of year. It's not going to end well for anyone if they're too cautious to finish the harvest, and when the party investigates, they'll find that to be the case. Farmers have seen something creeping through their fields at night, and the one nearest the forest has even had a few animals go missing. For now, it's just being passed off as the usual wild knife. The farmer in question happy to keep quiet while the priest handles it. He's a pretty powerful cleric after all, might even have a few people under him. They've handled all the town's problems for a good 10 or 15 years now. Of course, that's also why he's worried. Those footprints aren't entirely animal. There used to be witches with forbidden magic in these woods. One he thought he took care of years ago. Since he was unable to finish them in his prime, he wants the party to find and take out the source, offering up some of his own gear as payment. The promise of gold or magical items is sure to pique the party's interest, but they need to be quick. The festival is traditionally on a full moon. The extra light is useful, but it's a perfect time for the vile old magic of hags. The one he's worried about specialized in curses and fire, making the harvest a perfect time to reap revenge, especially since the lack of food might force them to rely on her. It's a classic enough of a setup that the party might not even question it. If pressed however, he'll explain that when he was done being an adventurer, he retired to build a church in a village he liked. He started redeeming and killing all the local threats, some of which were a coven of witches. People would barter with them for weird remedies, sometimes come back cursed or killed, the usual stuff. The witch he's particularly worried about used to live in town under the pretense of trying to be good, but she kept on cursing everyone and setting houses on fire. Tried to redeem her and teach her to be good, she rejected it, did what he had to. He thought he took her out with a spell that would leave no body to raise, but he's afraid that she might have tricked him and come back for revenge. He hasn't had to deal with more than goblin raiders and owl bears in years. He knows he stands no chance, but he has to protect this town. Please. That right there will be more than enough for most, but if you have a really suspicious party, you might notice that he looks uncomfortable. He will never admit it, but he's withholding some information. Now here's our main split in the timeline. Let's start by playing it straight with a determined but lost party. They start asking random people about the creatures in the wood or the missing animals. The townsfolk are happy to point them in the direction of a farm, one on the outskirts. This sort of thing isn't too unusual. With a little questioning, the farmer will tell him that what he saw wasn't just a beast. That's your reward for an inquisitive party. They get to see the ambush coming. When the party approaches the animal to attack or befriend, they'll find it's not the only thing lurking in the field. There's also Bay. For Pathfinder folk, I recommend two or three Nuglub gremlins with troll hounds to match. The hound knocking them down so the Bay can get their sneak attack. You can also just let there be an owl bear or grizzly as a decoy, with a trio of teleporting twig jacks waiting in ambush. In 5e, a pair of red caps works great with an owl bear mount to cover their speed. Maybe even a yeth hound if it's evening or in the woods. Either way though, there's something more than just hungry aminals around. We're gonna need a series of checks. Something like survival to follow the tracks, wisdom to throw off the enchantment of the woods compelling them to go in circles, and dexterity or reflex to counter all the fae trying to mess with them. Not bite them, mind you. Make every failed check describe some minor shenanigans. Pixies throwing nuts from above while others snag a bit of clothing. Quicklings dart past and grab something from her bag. Or magic vines trip them up while fairies try to steal a tooth or hair. Eventually they'll emerge into the witch's clearing, arguing about how someone's eyebrow can just wander off or something. Smoke will be chuffing from the fireplace of the hut. She is clearly home. Anything with an intelligence of 8 or more that comes within 30 feet must make an intelligence check. If they fail, every flame in the area starts hissing, Intruder. 
If they pass, they might be able to sneak up on her. The witch will have no warning. She's a rather unassuming girl, late teenager, with all the screeching fury and panic of the cornered feral animal she technically is. I knew more murderers would come for me. Far too little. Far too late. Trying to talk is possible if they are very quick, but there is no way to completely talk her down. That tempo will topple and its clergy will burn. But that's for another route. This party knows the mission. The witch won't stick around, but her reaction changes if they snuck up on her. Behind the witch is a living ritual circle of lilies and poppies and heliotrope with rose vines weaving together to form an arcane staff in the center. Fire poppies are woven throughout, and at the top is a giant one blooming into a swirling vortex. If the witch knew what's coming, she'll already have her action ready to activate the staff. A couple buds will bloom to release displacer beasts or bladewe. On her next turn, she'll call forth the elemental from her cauldron spire, a fire elemental or a filth fire, and disappear with the staff. If they manage to surprise her though, she absolutely panics. She rips the staff free and teleports far. The flowers all burst open with a flood of fey of every sort, from fairies and gremlins to cord and Kwedji. Most will just jump out the window or start tearing up the place, but the vines form back into a shambling mound or shambler. This one's special. Instead of lightning absorption, it has fire absorption, and instead of healing from it, it summons a weak fang. Twigjack or Meanlock are my choice, but anything works. Either way, if there's one thing she knows how to do, it's escape via teleporting. The priest will be horrified at the news and rally the townsfolk to the chapel. Night will fall, the moon will rise, and if there's two things she knows, it's how to set things on fire. Fae are zipping around everywhere and have given her a new enchanted form. The witch when she gets to depends on her preparation. If she was prepared, she marches in with some fiery plant creatures. I know those don't really exist, but it's easy to reskin an elemental like an ember fox or fire snake as being made of burning brush. She also has her incomplete brush fire staff, and if you don't want to use my stats, Pathfinder people can reskin a witch weird by swapping the force absorption to fire, and D&D denizens will find favor with a conjuration wizard. However, if the party took her off guard in her hut and she ripped the staff free, she doesn't have that control. They don't really get a fight in this one, they get a force of nature. An entire stand of trees marching like a mini-legged spider bound together and puppeted by thorny vines, or a forest fire given form as an all-consuming whirlwind. The point is that she panicked and screwed up the ritual, but decided it didn't matter as long as she got revenge. She is a conduit with a single goal, killing that priest. Her form naturally destroys anything that's near, but she only really cares about that cleric. The party either has to flee with him until her body gives out, or try to take her out before she blitzes through and kills him. If they fight, bump her AC up a point or two and jack up that HP. You could also just give her a resin shell that they have to break through. The point is that she's tanky and they only have a couple rounds to blitz her before she insta-kills that priest. The party is making saves against slashing vines or scorching heat or whatever disaster you chose. Let's say 3d6. Hard enough to hurt, but it's not really an attack, just the cost of existing within like 20 feet of her. However, they might choose the smart option and run like the priest is screaming to. She's no faster than the party and they do have a head start, but she does ignore all the road hazards, like plants rising up to grab them, normally trivial creatures attacking, the ground opening up into chasms, a stampede breaking loose and threatening to trample them. It's basically a gauntlet of rapid fire problems that pose little threat themselves, but every failed save a round spent fighting brings her closer. I even made a random table. Roll or pick what you like. Maybe have the failures lead to some of the town getting picked off. If she catches up, she will immediately drag him in and eviscerate him. Maybe she'll die, maybe she'll flee. Either way, the danger is finally over. Oh, and if your party's not into cinematic encounters, just throw out a big monster like a wood golem or a reskinned hydra. Same principle, creature they couldn't normally take on, but stand a chance against because it's ignoring them for a few rounds. Either way, if the priest survives, he will happily reward them. And if he dies, I mean one of the first rules of adventuring is loot the body, friend or foe. Of course, that assumes they went down the primary path. Let's go back to the start and do that again. This time, the party didn't even bother going to the priest. They just heard something has a reward on its head and ran. Or maybe they did touch base with the priest, but they didn't bother questioning him or the townsfolk. They just got going. They dash right over to the fields, rip the beast apart, and run off into the woods. Getting there so quickly means the witch is still out gathering ingredients. The portal's barely formed. Very low AC, high HP, and three regeneration. It can't hurt the party itself, but it spews out a weak creature for every 10 HP of damage done. You can also have it always spew out one creature, but the level goes up for every additional 10 HP of damage done in a turn. I recommend budgeting this as a very tough fight, because they control how many things are attacking them at a time. I'd say around 100 HP will be right for most parties, but feel free to adjust your particular party's needs, especially since the cauldron in the middle has started spewing out mind-affecting fumes. Any creature with an intelligence of 10 or more has to make a DC 22 will save, 15 wisdom in D&D. On failure, all your past failure bubbles to the front of your mind, like when you're trying to sleep at night, except this time it lowers your speed by 10 and gives you a minus two circumstance penalty to attacks. It'll stop after a minute, but destroying the cauldron or dispelling its magic will end the effect early. And yes, this is a modified Scholar's Bane trap. Paizo's Adventure Path 187 has some amazing ideas. 
Anyway, wrecking the portal just leaves the witch. She'll try to fight, but after a round, he'll probably flee with Dimension Door or Misty Step. Turn it into a hunt, organizing the mobs of villagers and sending them out to corner her. The party shouldn't have much trouble in a fight, but the more she burns to the village, the more it eats into the reward. Of course, if they do take her out in the hut, congratulations. You get less drama, but you did clean everything up before it could begin. That said, we can also wind back the clock for my favorite option. Let's say they get the quest, but don't trust the cleric. If the party starts questioning the town about the old witches, the villagers start getting cagey. Some might talk about how vaguely bad and terrifying things were, but most just avoid the subject. Those were the old days. Now they have a cleric who saved them more times than they can count. The barkeeper, or whoever gave them the quest, can be convinced with the right check or coin. Right shame what happened to that girl if you ask him, but anyone smart enough to agree is also smart enough to keep their trap shut. That little witchy spare did curse a good few people, but mostly just pranks that wore off quickly. She's a child, what do you expect? And yes, there were some bigger ones, maybe a fire or three, but if you meddle with a mage that can barely control her powers, that's on you if you bring out something she can't fix. If that is her out there, try to talk to her. She seemed like she was a good sort. Hope the years on the run didn't change that. Alternatively, you might have them discover the grave of said witch. Not in the graveyard, but behind the herbalist's house. Telling her why you want to know about the grave will get a bitter laugh. The minister really shouldn't be so harsh. Truth like that, and he's practically by himself. The old witches were just providing the remedies they could with what they had. Yes, people did die when they ignored the instructions or tried to threaten them. What the people really fear is retribution for helping remove her. Some of them more enthusiastically than others. The grave's out back because she used to be a surrogate mother to the child. Bit of an open secret that she was a witch herself. Though at the time, she hadn't been old and powerful enough to join the coven. At least she was able to talk people down when the witch hunt showed up. Because wasn't she redeemed now, spared by their god? Little Amy was fine, and if that is her, she hopes her revenge goes well. If nothing else for her own sake, she's getting a bit too old to be running from an angry mob. If the party decides they want to help the witch, the herbalist will spray them with a pungent perfume to ward off the magic of the woods for a few hours. Either way, they'll find the field encounter and eventually track down the witch in her home. She'll pop herself up and threaten for them to leave, but scale back down to wary if they say they just want to talk. Yes, she's going to get revenge on those who tormented her and tried to kill her. Her and all the others who followed the natural way. Killed for the teachings of an old murderer hiding under heroics. So unless they want to assist her in ridding the world of him, she'd ask they leave her be. Now she'll be willing to spare the followers the old faith, like the barkeep if she knows they exist, and with some bargaining she might agree to only destroy the church and clergy. But that part is not negotiable. If they join her, congratulations, new path. She's getting ready to burn this place down while letting the fey rampage to get revenge alongside her. The old witches were peacekeepers on behalf of the town, and the townspeople annoyingly broke a lot of contracts over the years. Without the might of a coven, she'll need some help stabilizing this ritual, including an ingredient she dare not try to grab by herself. Now obviously you can just throw out a big monster, and for some parties that will be right, but consider this. Track down ether spiders to collect their webbing to bind your portal with. Fae spiders if it's D&D. She needs either the spinnerets or a good amount of webbing. This gives them the challenge of killing them before they can shift away, weakening them enough that they'll still fight before bursting them down as a game all in itself. However, they're intelligent and willing to trade if the party's clever enough to realize it. Hunting down a deer or something should be trivial for them, and food for webbing seems like a pretty normal trade. It even works thematically. The webbing's whole purpose is to bind things across planes. Or you could use my updated custom oil slick spiders. Now for Pathfinder 2e as well. They like to dig traps and cover them up with flammable webbing. The trap gets disguised by falling leaves and such, and when something falls in, they use their flint mandibles to barbecue people. If the party doesn't want to fight, they can just fall into a trap, then grab their webbed up partner and run. And a third option, if your party's just not looking for a fight, send them into the church. In the back of the church is a little hallway with a few rooms, one being a storeroom. The sacred herbs they use in service should focus the fey on only the devout. While they're back there, have them set off with essentially a methane stink bomb. We can't smell it, but some vultures can detect it from miles away. A flock of circling vultures with no sign of death is about the clearest sign of impending disaster possible. Every follower of the old faith will be warding themselves in their homes tonight. When they return, she's finished the portal in its full majesty, with twisting thorns and bursts of color in every scent imaginable. Normally, she would bind them to attack all who scorn the old ways. However, if you convinced her not to kill the townsfolk, she'll turn them exclusively against the devout of Serenray or the clergy of Serenray. It has to be against the followers of whatever god you chose. Naming them is important. Her staff completely unravels as everything blooms and dozens of fiery fey and plant creatures start spilling out. Thanks to their efforts, only smaller fey she can actually command will come. It won't start flying out of control. There'll be enough to clean up the town and clergy, scrub the town clean of every trace of the church, but it turns out that the priest is your job. The old cleric is actually devoted to a god of trickery, like Savannah. Figured this was a harmless way of keeping everyone safe. Yes, he drove out the witches, but they're consorting with fey. Everyone knows that's a horrible idea. He's just trying to keep the townsfolk safe from their own stupidity before some idiot makes a deal that gets everyone killed. Getting rid of all the fey touched children was at worst an unfortunate precaution, and at best stopping a young hag spawn like he's convinced she is. Surely they get it, they're adventurers. Killing all the potential and current threats to an area is literally what they do.
do. He's not entirely wrong, but I think we all know someone's dying tonight. Now, he might be past his prime, but he was still a powerful adventurer once. One with a god vaguely on his side. Stats in the link in the description, but basically a tanky cleric if you want to build him your own way. If the piles are too unwieldy for you because you're doing this IRL or something, make an elite solid of Asmodeus or a weakened priest of Phorasma if you're in Pathfinder. An enchantment or illusion wizard is good for 5e, or even a cambion if you change its fire to radiant damage and take out the fly speed. Either way, he also calls an ally to his side, because every good boss needs minions to keep up the pressure. For Pathfinder, I recommend having statues of the goddess rise up as animated statues or divine warden. For 5e, I recommend sets of animated armor or a helmed horror. You could even dip into clockwork creatures, a gift from an old artificer friend. For a little extra twist, as long as they're on church grounds and the priest is alive, have two party members swap places every round. Just assign each party member to a number and roll two dice. A little boon from his goddess of trickery for the wonderful long con. If you'd like, you can have the witch bite alongside the players and just add an extra minion or use stronger ones. But if you don't want even more to keep track of, have a small portal appear above the church. It starts spewing out weaker angels and the witch has to take care of it while the players take out the priest. The players get a moment to loot the place and priest before the witch and they rip them apart. You can have the witch become the new protector and peacekeeper, or just fly off into the night. The revenge finally complete. Either work great for fall, but I did mention I'd help out with other seasons. In winter, the town is entirely holed up. The place isn't bustling with travelers, but the taverns are full. The mood is mostly cheery, but insight might show unease in the air. Like they're partially trying to have a good time to ignore something. The barkeep will let him know that a winter festival is coming up, but there have been talks of whispers in the wind. The clergy told him to send every adventure he finds to the chapel. In this case, it's not a full moon that gives the witch power. Their calendar has 30 days per month and a week between years. They're days that even the gods couldn't wrench from the world, and he fears what she might conjure while the primal rituals are at their strongest. Most encounters work the same, with a few easy substitutions. Swap out the bears for a winter wolf or two, and have the staff use winter flowers like camellia and winter jasmine. If they sneak up on the witch, the shambler or mound uses cold damage instead. If she goes berserk, you might make her wrath a snowstorm, but you really just need reflavoring. If you look at most winter myths other than Santa, you'll find that fey and cold go together hand in hand already. As for spring, it's basically the same as fall, just swapping harvest for planting. The party's first meeting might be with a lumberjack hard at work clearing land for construction. The clergy's worried because fey are strongest when life grows back, and he's worried about the figures in the field and what they might be planting. Instead of animals, it's weird plants growing in overnight. Go full overgrowth theme and have the staff grow vegepigmy or leshy instead of fey. And of course, in the summer, building is underway. Locals volunteering to build during the day because the church donates a round or two if you help. This time they're messing with the carpenters instead of farmers, slowing progress in the wall. The locals think their project is just angering the fey, but the priest is pretty sure it's a witch sending them out. The brush fire theme is already perfect. This is the prime season for wildfires after all. I kinda just went with it in fall because I like making nature people fiery. Anyway, finally, two quick pieces of info to end this off. Number one is that a little flavor lets you shove pretty much anything anywhere. A story about a witch's revenge doesn't have to be just a Halloween. If you ever want to do an adventure or module but you don't think the theme fits, change it. Make Curse of Strahd into a tyrannical candy land. Who's gonna stop ya? And secondly, most importantly, inspiration can come from anywhere. Find something you like and tweak it, or rebuild it with your own flair. It's fine. It's what every sentient creature does. Dante's 4th Century Divine Trilogy was self-insert Mary Sue fan fiction led by his favorite author, Virgil. Virgil was a 1st century author building on Homer, and 3,000 years ago, Homer was making fiction of folktales. Folktales of gods who'd already been through many names and cultures. Even if you don't add on to a story or tweak it, everything becomes different because it's you and your friends telling it, with your own ideas and viewpoints. And even if it's still not, it's your home game. Who cares if it's loosely based off a song from one of your favorite YouTube musicians? That's right, this started off as a parody of Aviator Scarlet Vow. Come on, how could I not? Casting off the shackles to reject your given name, the one who burns the witches always ends up in the flame? That is just too cool. Much like my supporters, Eldenu95, Martyr Masquerade, and Feral Coblin. Thanks for helping me buy things for the show. And if you want to help, just hit the coffee link below and comment to tell me what you think of the adventure or how much you love Scarlet Bat.